We're going to solve the physics loop the loop problem. Uh, I've sketched out the problem here on the screen. Uh, so the problem is you basically want to find what is the minimum height that you have to make the hill in order for this block to slide down the hill smoothly, go around the loop the loop while always remaining in contact with the loop. Uh, this problem has been stumping physics students uh, for decades. So today we're going to uh, have a crack at it. Um, what I like most about this problem is uh, it involves uh, Newton's laws, uh, it involves some circular motion, and also involves uh, conservation of energy. All right, let's look at a couple limiting cases here that I've sketched out on the board. Uh, case number one is when you have a very high hill and a tiny little loop. So in this case, you're simply going to slide down this hill, you're going to carry quite a lot of speed, and then you'll be able to go upside down around the loop the loop and continue along the track. In case number two, you have a tiny little hill and you have a very large loop. So in this case, you're probably just gonna slide down the loop and probably make it about halfway up the track and then slide back down. So you will not make it all the way around. Uh, case number three is a rather interesting case. Uh, case number three, you have a, a hill that has a height h and the height h is equal to twice the radius or the diameter of this loop. Uh, so this one, I'm not sure if you're going to make it all the way around. So we're going to have to let uh, the physics dictate whether this case uh, is going to be okay or not. Okay, so let's first consider what happens when you go around the loop in a little bit more detail. Let's, ha let's have a look at what happens when you're carrying quite a lot of speed when you're upside down versus the case where you're not quite uh, carrying enough speed to go around the loop. In the first case, when you're carrying quite a lot of speed, as you're going around the loop, uh, the track is pushing you. You're trying to remain on this circular path, so the force of the track onto the mass is always toward the center of the track. And in that case, uh, you're always in contact with the loop. Uh, in other words, whenever you're in contact with the loop, uh, we'll always say there's a normal force or this contact force of the track on the loop, even when you're upside down. So what happens when you don't quite have enough speed? Well, when you don't quite have enough speed, let's assume you just make it this high. And then at some point before you reach the top, you're going to lose contact with the track. So that means if you lose contact with the track, uh, that the, the force from the track onto the mass will become zero at some point before uh, you reach the top of the loop. So we need to figure out where that point is. Okay, so let's begin by analyzing all of the energy at the top of the hill versus all of the energy at the top of the loop. Okay. When we're at the top of the hill, all our energy is in the form of gravitational potential energy, and the amount of energy we have at the top is simply equal to mass times little g times the height. And that there has to be equal to all of the energy when we're at the top of the loop. Okay. When we're at the top of the loop, uh, we're still a certain height above the ground, so we're going to have some uh, gravitational potential energy. And again, gravitational potential energy is simply mass times little g times twice the radius in this case. Uh, when we're at the top of the loop now, we want to be carrying a little bit of speed, uh, so we're also going to have to have some kinetic energy at the top of the loop. And the kinetic energy at the top of the loop is simply going to be one half uh, mv squared. Uh, we didn't put any kinetic energy initially uh, on this side of the equation because I'm just assuming that we're, we're just barely moving or we're starting from a condition of rest. Okay, so let's look at this equation. So we know a lot of quantities in this equation. We know the mass, we know little g, we know the radius of the loop. Um, so you could say, well, you can just solve for the height in this problem and then you're done. Uh, the problem is uh, you don't know the speed. You don't know the speed at the top of the loop. So while this equation is useful and we're going to use it in uh, two more slides, we need to find an expression for the speed of the object when it's at the top of the loop. And this equation doesn't allow us to do that. We can isolate for the height, uh, but we're still left with, an un with one unknown uh, in this equation. Okay. So let's have a look a little bit more specifically at the top of the loop. Okay, so I now want to consider the situation when the block is at the top of the loop and is carrying some speed. 
Let's start by writing down uh, all the forces acting on the object when it's upside down. Okay, so at the top of the loop, while well, the object still has a mass, therefore there's still a weight. And the weight is simply mass times gravity. Uh, also, if you're carrying some amount of speed and the object is in contact with the track, uh, there's also a contact force, and I'm going to call that a normal force. And that force is also acting down. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to consider here. Uh, I'm going to consider a coordinate system where everything acting down is going to be defined as a positive number, and everything acting away will be a negative number. So all we have to do at this point is simply uh, add all the forces. If you sum all the forces acting on the object at the top of the loop, uh, you're going to have the normal force plus the weight of the object. And that must be equal to mass times the acceleration of the object. Uh, we know it has to be accelerating. There's two forces acting on the object. And Newton's second law tells us you just add those up. And those are equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, so we have one more consideration here. This object is going around in a circle. So we have some circular motion. Circular motion. So we can simplify this a little bit further. If we remember from our class, uh, the acceleration for circular motion is given by v squared divided by the radius. OK, so now we're going to substitute uh, this acceleration into the sum of the forces, into Newton's second law, and simplify this, this equation a little bit. So if you substitute the acceleration inside Newton's second law, you get simply mv squared divided by r. OK, now I'm going to just simplify this one more step here. I'm going to write the normal. It's going to be equal to two terms. Uh, the first term is v squared over r, and then also uh, minus gravity. So you see here, uh, I've just factored out the mass into this equation, so it's pretty straightforward. So here's our equation for the normal force. And remember what the normal force is. This is a contact force between the track and the mass. So this is an important equation here. Also, you see it's the difference between two terms, so that's also very important. So what happens when the speed is very, very big uh, compared to gravity? Or this term, the first term, v squared over r, is very big compared to gravity. Uh, you're going to get a very large positive number. And that means that there's a very large contact force between the track and the object. What happens now if I lower the velocity a little bit, or I lower the speed of the object? There becomes a point where this term here, the first term, is simply going to be equal to the second term. Right? And that means that the contact force will eventually, there's some specific value of the speed that will make this contact force equal to zero. And that's what we want to find. We want to make the contact force equal to zero. What speed must we have in order to make that contact force equal to zero? And that's pretty straightforward. We simply want this term in the bracket to be equal to zero. So we're going to get n equals to zero uh, when v is going to be equal to uh, root of little g times r. When this condition is satisfied, we are not going to have a contact force when we're at the top of the loop. OK, so let's go back and look at the conservation of energy in the system. We had that the gravitational potential energy at the top of the hill was equal to the gravitational potential energy at the top of the loop plus a kinetic energy term. And the problem with this equation was we didn't have the speed of the object when I was at the top of the, top of the loop. But now we know uh, from looking at the uh, sum of the forces acting on the object and requiring that there is a contact force at the top of the loop, we got an expression for the speed that was equal to the square root of g divided by r. So all we have to do now is simply substitute that term into the kinetic energy of the object. Uh, the left-hand side of this equation doesn't change. The gravitational potential energy at the top of the loop doesn't change. And all I want to do now is substitute in root g over uh, root g times r into the kinetic energy. And what am I left with? I'm left with this equation over here. I can cancel out a lot of terms here, actually. If you look at uh, the mass is, is in every single term, I can get rid of that. I can also get rid of little g. 
That's in all of the terms. So what am I left with? On the left hand side, I'm left with the height of the hill must be equal to twice the radius uh, plus an additional term, which ends up being uh, radius divided by two. If you combine both of those terms, you end up getting that the height of the hill must be five times the radius uh, divided by two. So an example, if you had a radius uh, of a loop-to-loop -loop that's equal to four meters, you would require the minimum height be at least five over four divided by two, 10 meters. So as long as that hill is 10 meters high, you're gonna carry enough speed to always remain in contact with the loop and go around safely. Uh, this is a nice problem. Uh, I also like that we didn't really have any numbers to substitute in, but a lot of things just canceled out here at the end, especially when you substituted in the speed into the kinetic energy equation. I noticed the mass canceled out. Yeah, that was involved in every single term. Uh, and that's kind of a good thing, right? You don't want the height of this hill to depend on the mass of the object, because that would mean you'd have a different solution if you have an object that's light versus an object that's heavy. So the solution at the end simply depends on the geometry of the object, right? in this case being the hill and the radius of the loop. Okay, so there's the general solution. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, uh, just submit a comment and I'll reply to any questions I get. Thank you.